Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Why don't you give Jesus a hand clap of praise today? Amen. 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 Thank you so very, very much, Collinsworth family, for staying over from Friday night to worship what I believe is the greatest church in the country, and I'm glad that you're uh, here this morning. <clears throat> Y'all are in the mood to clap, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for understanding about last Sunday. I just uh, had a, uh, got a little bit of exposure, and I didn't want to cause anybody to think that I could pass it on to them, so I just took a Sunday off. I enjoyed it. I, I <laughs> kicked my feet up and watched it online and didn't Justin do a great job uh, in the Word of God last week. He really, really did. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter number six, if you will. Uh, I know while you're turning, I know um, many of you have keenly uh, been watching the events going on in California with... Uh, particularly uh, Santa Clara, California, Santa Clara County, uh, California, and North Valley Baptist Church who have uh, been having uh, worship services in the room, uh, exercising discipline and going by the rules, and yet uh, Santa Clara County has fined them 50-something thousand dollars. Uh, we need to be praying for that church. You also, I'm sure, have uh, followed, have followed uh, John MacArthur with great interest in what uh, God is doing in their church as well. Uh, we're, uh, we're a little bit more blessed here in North Carolina than some of the churches are having to deal with in California. Um, we still, I, I don't understand all of this, but... Uh, we still are not counted as uh, an essential. We're still non-essential. I don't know how you say that worshiping God is non-essential, uh, but we are non-essential. And I was thinking about North Valley Baptist Church. I was thinking about what the government's decisions are about gathering and worshiping God on Sundays and uh, thinking about some of the consequences that many are facing. And a passage of scripture out of the Gospel of Matthew hit my mind when I thought about the riots and protests that are going on across the country, the killings, the pillage, the burning, all of that. And uh, combine those two things in this passage. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 12, that uh, these are the words of Jesus in the description of what, um, what it's going to look like in our culture uh, during the last days prior to us seeing the Lord Jesus face to face. And Jesus himself says that lawlessness will abound and the love of many will wax cold. Would you agree with me that well, that's a descriptive of where we are today. It's also a descriptive of what it's going to be like just prior to Jesus coming back. Well, Daniel faced a lot of pressure in his day as well. Uh, Daniel was promoted over and over and over again as a teenager in a foreign land. You know, David asked the question, how... Can a man sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, Daniel was a great example of that. Uh, when he was 15 years old, he made some decisions that uh, weren't popular and uh, rubbed against the grain of the culture of his day. When he was in his 20s, he did the same thing. When he's in 30s, he did the same thing. And now we're finding Daniel, he's 82 years old. Getting on up there. And once again, he is faced with a major decision that he's got to make in his life. Am I going to stand for God or am I going to succumb to the pressures of a godless culture? What am I going to do? And he had that decision to make. 
Uh, Daniel was promoted by Darius. Darius uh, comes in with the um, Persian Empire. They have overthrown the Babylonian Empire there in the what is now known as uh, Iran and Iraq. And uh, Darius sees this character and this integrity. He sees the same kind of man that others had seen that had promoted him all through those years. And, and he comes in, overthrows the Babylonian uh, government, and he decides, well, I'm going to keep this guy. Uh, I'm going to hang on to him. And he puts him as the third in charge of his kingdom. He divides his kingdom up into about 24 different quadrants and uh, he puts princes over them. He's got three governors that manage those 24 princes and here if we find Daniel was one of them. Now the other guys didn't like him. Maybe it was because he was Jewish. I don't know. Uh, but they didn't like him. You know, a lot of people don't like us because we're Christians. Uh, they didn't like him. And so they go to Darius and they say, Darius, you know, you're great, you're wonderful, you're amazing. They buttering him up. And they said, you know what, all these people that are praying to these other gods around, you know, we want to honor you. We've had this meeting together with all the princes and governors, but they, that, they lied about that because... Daniel was not invited to the meeting. He didn't have a say-so about it. And they said, uh, you know, you're great and you're wonderful. We've had this meeting and we want to do something as an expression of our admiration and love and appreciation for you. And so we want you to sign into law that for the next 30 days, nobody's going to pray to anybody except you. Well, now that scratched his ego just a little bit, you know. It, it appealed to that ego side of Darius. He says, you know, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And uh, they said, now, now Darius, we, we want you to take this thing seriously and, and we're not all talking about some decree here or some suggestion about this. We want you to sign this in the law. Now, you have to understand something about the Persian law that once it was signed by the king itself, no one could eliminate it. Nobody could eradicate it. Nobody could usurp it. Even the king who signed it into law could not produce an executive order to overturn it. And so, lo and behold, he signed it into law that for the next 30 days, all the prayers would be directed toward him, him being Darius. Now, that put Daniel in a pickle. It put him in a spot. What's he gonna do? He has about six different options. Uh, his first option was that he could just fake pray it, you know? I'll just fake it, I'll just bluff my way through, I'll act like I'm praying, I'll look like I'm praying, everybody will think I'm praying, but I'm really not praying, I'm just faking my way through. The other option that he could is that he and Darius were buddies, man, they were friends. He could go to Darius and he could say to him, now king, I, now I know what you've done and I, I know you think that you did the right thing, but Darius, you put me in a spot here and I really need for you just to kind of turn a blind eye and a deaf ear here for me because you put me in a situation I can't win. And he could have buttered up Darius and maybe entered into some kind of backdoor agreement with him. The, the, the third option that he had is that uh, he could just not pray at all. He's not going to pray to anybody. The fourth option was that he could uh, just pray in secret. I can just shut my windows and shut my doors and I can continue to pray, but you know what? He was a man of integrity. He was a man of character. He was not going to yield to that uh, whatsoever. Uh, he, he could somehow do what we do in democracy. He could have got him a sign and he could have gone out into the streets and he could have walked up and down the streets and he could have protested the law, but... Let me remind you, 
the Median Persian law was not democracy. Uh, it wouldn't even if he could have got the sentiment of everybody. There was no voting. They were not going to change the law. So he had a sixth option. And that was to continue doing what he'd always been doing. Just keep praying like he had always been praying. Let me ask you a question before I go any further in the message. If uh, that case were true today, what would you do? Which of the six options would you do? What direction would you go in? In other words, here's the, the real depth of the question. Here's where the grease hits the squeak. How far are you really willing to go for your faith? How much are you really willing to take on for the cause of Christ? How deep are you willing to go for Jesus? Now, it's one thing to come here on a Sunday morning. Huh. It's one thing here to come and lift our hands and to clap and to praise God and to shout hallelujah in the confines of this, but it's another to stand for Jesus on your website. It's another to stand for Jesus on your jobs. It's another to stand for Christ in your schools. It's another to stand for Jesus in your neighborhood or in your, in your family. Uh, it's one thing to stand for the Lord and it's another to be a secret disciple. You know what? Do you know what Daniel did? Out of those six options, do you know what he did? Let's read for a minute in verse 10 and, and I want you to see exactly what Daniel did. Watch this in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, in other words, all right, it's in the law now. Nobody can do anything about this. He went back to his house, opened up the windows to his house that really faced Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God. Notice the latter phrase of the verse. As he had always done. As was his custom. As was his habit. The same thing that he had been doing long before the decree and the law ever took place. Now, here's the deal. You ready? That's exactly what his enemies wanted him to do. They already knew he was a man of character. They already knew his integrity. They already knew that he had taken a stand for Jesus and all had done that all of his life. And they knew he wasn't going to change now. And so they set that trap for him and he said well it's a law now what am I going to do I know if I do what I'm about to do it's probably going to cost me my job I know if I do what I've always done it may even cost me my life because the penalty that they had established was I'm going to throw you into a den of lions so I'm probably going to die if I keep doing what I've been doing but he went back to the house, opened up the windows, got down on his knees, and he just prayed like he had done every day for 82 years. How was he so unafraid? How, how, could, how could he be that way? I want to tell you, he did three things uh, that I believe that you and I really need to look at. All right? The first thing that he did is that he looked back. And he looked back and he saw the faithfulness of God every time that he had ever stood in the face of opposition. He said, you know what? Uh, when I was 15 years old and I was told that I couldn't eat that and I was forced to have to eat something else and I didn't do it, God, you were faithful. And God, when Nebuchadnezzar said that I have to bow down to his image or die, I didn't bow, but here I am. God, you were faithful. Faithful, And then when I had to go give the news to the king that he didn't want to hear and I was terrified to go do that and yet I knew that I had to be faithful to you, God, and God, I did it and I'm still here. God, you were faithful then and I believe that you're gonna be faithful now. He looked back and then he looked up three times a day 
he prayed unto the Lord. Three times a day, he sought the mind and the heart and the will of God. No wonder he was strong in character and integrity and filled with wisdom and elevated at every position at every level of his life is because he sought God for direction. He sought God for decisions. And God looked after him. So he said, you know, God, I can't back down now, so... I know you're going to have to take care of me. And then he looked ahead. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this, but he got to measuring the risk versus the reward. And he said, you know what? If I can just minimize the risk or minimize the fear, then the reward, keep my eyes on the rewards, I'm going to be all right. Don't let fear, he says, I'm not going to let this fear dominate me and cause me to do something that I know is not in your will and in your plan. Do you know that overcoming fear, really, is minimized? I wish when I was a kid, hey kids, I wish when I was a teenager that somebody had taught me this lesson, that overcoming fear is really minimizing the negative factors that I have surrounding me and maximizing the benefits I wish somebody had taught me that. Now understand something. What happened to Daniel will happen to you. Y'all hearing me? You may not get thrown into a lion's den, but I promise you this, you will be ostracized. People will gossip about you. May even cost you your job. So what happened to Daniel could happen to you. Now, how in the world then do you minimize the risks or the negative factors and stay focused in on the benefits of God when you're standing for God? And I, I'm, I'm just this convinced with all my heart. This is one of the reasons I'm bringing this message today. I, I believe that in the future days, you and I are going to be called on to stand before God or stand for God more than ever before in our life. So what are you going to do? What are you you, you, got to, you got to figure out what those benefits are. Let me give you six of them real quick. I even got less time today. But let, let me just do, go through these rapid fire if I could. Number one, you ready for this one? Fear is released. Fear is released. In the New Testament church, as the church was getting started, and these new Christians discovered that now that I'm saved, now that I'm born again, the Roman government says to me that I have broken the law and it's punishable by death. And so if they declared their faith in Jesus, it was at risk to their own life. Here's what the word of God says. Lord, you know the threats people make, so help us as your servants to speak your word without fear. Now you understand that every time that you stand for God, you then release some of that fear that is really binding uh, in your heart. And you know what fear does? Fear has a way of convincing you that this is the way it's going to be forever. You have to understand, feeling, fear is just a feeling. It's not going uh, to last uh, at all. The problem with most of us is, is that we get that fear out the back door, but we leave the front door wide open for it to come right back in again on us. But when you stand for the things of God and stand for God, it releases that fear. But when I give in to fear, here's what happens. When I give in to fear, fear has a way of growing stronger in my life, not lesser. When I stand against it, when I act against it, then the fear is released. But when I give in to the fear, the fear has a way of growing and getting even stronger. I got to thinking about the last 37 years of my leadership at First Baptist. And every major decision for the last 37 years scared me to death. How can we afford to do that? Will we ever be able to pay it back? Am I positive this is where God wants me to go? I'm not sure. And every time that I did not give in to fear, but I stood against it and acted against it. God lessened the fear in my life. But here's the second one, and this one's even better. When you lessen the fear and it releases you, what it does then, secondly, 
Faith is raised. Listen to this in 2 Timothy. Paul telling Timothy, you must never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. With the strength that God gives you, be ready to suffer if necessary to share the good news. Do you know that, listen to this, faith is like a muscle. And muscles have to be exercised. If you want them to grow and you want them to get stronger, you have to exercise that muscle of faith. And by the way, uh, can, can I just say to you, uh, that it's not going to grow by eating Twinkies and watching the Food Channel all day long. Doesn't happen that way. But the more you exercise your faith, the more godly you become, and the more wise you become, the more confident that you become. Let me give you number three. Not only is faith released, or excuse me, fear released, and faith raised, the Father is revealed. Watch this in verse 19. Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. Now, all night long, he's laid awake, hasn't been able to sleep. His friend's down there in that lion's den and he's worried sick about his condition. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. Can you hear him? And he said, Daniel, oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver you from the lions? Now, I don't know how long it was between verse 20 and verse 21. I imagine to Darius it may have seemed like a week. Daniel, are you all right? Did God deliver you? And I can just almost see his face. As he hears back, O oh, king, live forever. My God, send an angel down here and shut these lions' mouths. They haven't touched me because I've been innocent. And believe you, king, I didn't do you any harm either. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no matter of hurt was, not a scratch on him. Wow. You understand, here's what went on. He said, God delivered me. <laughs> I don't have a scratch on me, king. You don't, you don't have anything uh, to worry about. I've been saved in the midst of all of this. I want to ask you two questions. Well, maybe one. Has God ever delivered you out of a pit? How many of you, God's delivered out of a pit before? Could it be that the reason God hasn't delivered you out of a pit is because you didn't trust him enough to get into the pit? Daniel put God in a position for God to work a miracle. Could it be that we've never trusted God for a miracle in our life? You understand that standing firm is allowing that fear to be released out of our life and for faith to be raised in our life and for the Father to be revealed. Let me give you number four, family is revived. Paul said this in Philippians chapter one, verse 14. He said, because of what I've been through, many Christians have gained confidence and became uh, more bold in telling other people about Jesus. Paul said, I was shipwrecked, I was beaten, starved to death. He said, I've suffered a whole lot for Jesus, but every time that I have suffered for Jesus, it's encouraged more people around me to be courageous in their testimonies. Y'all ever see the movie Braveheart? That's one of my favorite movies. I don't know how many times I've seen it a bunch. But have you ever noticed that the hero in that movie, when he got courageous, everybody around him got courageous? And when you stand for Jesus... It'll be amazing how many more people will stand with you. Let me give you number five. 
I love this one. The faithless are reached. The faithless are reached. Watch verse 25 with me. Then King Darius wrote unto all people. Now, this is amazing to me. He wrote to everybody that dwell on the earth. Peace be multiplied to me. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel for he's the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end and he delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and earth and delivered Daniel from the power of the lion so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus. Can you believe that this pagan king could write such stuff as that? Let it be known of all of the world that the God of Daniel, he is the one true living God. Lost. Looked and saw what God had done. And they were reached. Let me give you number six. Future rewards. That's what I talked to you about a little bit in the introduction uh, a minute ago. Um, we just finished a powerful series uh, on um, the Beatitudes. You remember? And, and, and one of the very first ones that we looked at way back in April or May was in verse 11 of Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. It didn't say because of being fearful, but because of you standing for Jesus. Rejoice and be glad. In other words, when you stand for Jesus, be glad about something. Now he's fixing to tell us what we ought to be glad about. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. Do you know that this stuff's been going on for 2,500 years? That when you stand for Jesus, it's not gonna be popular for everybody around you. People are gonna get aggravated at you. They're gonna ostracize you. They're gonna say things about you. You may lose your job. It's been going on for 2,500 years. Do you know what causes people to stand is because they look ahead and they understand and they realize huh, the benefits are out of this world. So I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to stand for the things of God. There is a reward that is coming. Let me ask you a question while I close. Are you going to end well? Are you going to finish strong? Daniel, you go when he was 14 and 15 years old, he stood. When he's 20s, he stood. When he's 30s, he stood. Now we're finding him. By the way, let me say something to you. He's 82 in this passage, and his best days are still ahead of him because he does more at 85 than he did at 82. I may even go preach that sermon here one of these days, what he did when he was 85. One of the things that I'm watching right now in Christendom and in the church, I'm watching this happen in America today, that the baby boomers are retiring by the droves every day. Well, one, of the, one of the main considerations right now uh, of Social Security is what are we going to do with all these baby boomers who are retiring? And here's what I'm watching baby boomers do. They're, they're, they're buying motor homes. They're buying second and third homes. And they're saying to the church, you know, I've been serving in that capacity for all of these years and, and now I've got a little bit of freedom and I got a little bit of money and, and, and somebody else younger than me, they can take over teaching those preschoolers and, and they can take over teaching that class and, and, and somebody else needs to be, I've done it all my ministry. You know, I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Matter of fact, I find just the opposite. Are you going to finish well? You know what kept you know what kept Daniel strong? Three times a day. If you want to stand strong, you've got to kneel often. Are you
Are you going to stand strong? Are you going to finish well? Then you can see all kinds of benefits. Being afraid is going to dissipate. Your faith is going to rise. You're going to give God an opportunity to do a miracle. You know what? The reason many of you don't experience miracles is because you don't get in a pit. You want to see God do some great and some mighty things in your life, then stand for him. Take a risk. Let, let, me, let me help you. This hit me when I was closing out that last service. Do you remember when the nation of Israel was getting ready to go inhabit the promised land? And they got down there to a, an overflowing Jordan River that was rushing like torrents going down and they get to the edge of the river and they well, how in the world are we gonna get across it? Do, do you know when the waters parted was when they put their foot in the water? If they had just stood back and said, oh my, we'll never make it across that, that fear would have grown and grown and grown. But when they came up and they put that foot in the water, all of a sudden, shh, their fear went completely away. And their faith grew enormously. And God did a miracle. When you put your foot in the water, when you get in a pit, you give God the opportunity to do what only God can do. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.